It's just a little after 7.30. I think we're um, just about ready to start. So uh, what we're going to do here is I'm going to start off with a presentation about the life of Lisa Fitko and the genesis of the books that she wrote. And then um, we're going to move into a discussion of the, uh, the book, Escape Through the Pyrenees. And then depending upon how much time we have, we'll continue with a discussion of the people who knew Lisa here in Hyde Park. And um, well, we'll just go from there. So here I'm moving into the presentation. All right, Lisa Fitko, 1909 to 2005, Escape Through the Pyrenees. She was born in 1909 in the Austro-Hungarian -Hungar Empire. Her father was a leftist writer. Her parents moved from Budapest to Vienna where they spent World War I. After World War I, the family moved to Berlin where Lisa became in involved in anti-fascist activities. Okay, I'm getting a bunch of texts on my phone. I'm gonna check. I keep seeing messages that there's nothing in the chat. I don't People know. People just if, need to scroll um, up. People need to scroll up in the messages to see what you posted because so many messages have been posted since then. Okay, all right, and I'll continue with this. Okay, um, Lisa Fitko, uh, in the 1930s, she became active in the anti-fascist German resistance in Berlin. Um, in the 1930s, she was um, somewhat indiscreet and had to flee to Prague where she met Hans Fitko, married him and continued to work in the resistance. In the 1930s, they uh, moved from Prague to Basel to Paris, continuing to work in the resistance. Starting in 1940, um, they were living in Paris. They were sent, they had to register as um, foreign, residents and they were both sent to separate internment camps in southern France. Lisa escaped the camp, it was called Gurs, and went to Marseille where she was reunited with Hans. They both worked with the emergency rescue committee and guided hundreds of re refugees through the Pyrenees into Spain uh, in the year 1940. In, towards the end of 1940 or early 1941, they both uh, actually didn't escape to Cuba. They emigrated to Cuba with the help of the Emergency Rescue Committee. In the 1940s, they lived and worked in Cuba. In 1948, they immigrated to Chicago Hyde Park. And from 1948 to 2005, lived in East View Park. Um, 1960, Hans died. Uh, Lisa lived, and this will be a little bit later in the presentation, um, continued to live in Hyde Park. Uh, and in 1985, she retired. That was when she wrote and published Escape Through the Pyrenees, which in 19, 1991 was translated to English as as Escape Through the Pyrenees and published by Northwestern University Press. In 1992, she wrote and published Solidarity and Treason, uh, which was a slightly earlier period in her life. In the 1990s, she met Free Ness, Jacqueline Curley, and Jacqueline Zevin. Uh, and they, they became very good friends. Um, after moving to Hyde Park, Lisa worked for several import-export firms and eventually did 
uh, and I might say because of her uh, expertise with language, um, eventually did office work at the University of Chicago. She also continued um, to work uh, as an activist. She helped organize Hiroshima Day in Hyde Park, was active as a precinct captain, tirelessly demonstrated against the Vietnam War, uh, picketed for farm workers, helped to organize clerical workers at the University of Chicago, and served as board president of Harper Square, a housing co-op des designed to integrate residents both racially and economically. She continued to be a beloved and respected member of movements for peace throughout the remainder of her life here in Hyde Park. <coughs> After her death, her three friends, Freddie Ness, Jacqueline Curley, and Jacqueline Seven, founded the Lisa Fitco Internship at Crossroads Fund. And this was um, uh, a memorial to uh, Lisa, which was trying to foster the, the ideals and the things that she believed in. Um, by fostering young progressive leaders. It supports youth-led organizing through the Youth Fund for Social Change. In, nine, in 2017, the Crossroads Fund sponsored the life of Lisa Fitko, a video narrated by Free Ness. And uh, we wanted to show some pieces of that video tonight but unfortunately it just didn't translate well to Zoom. So we decided just to put the link to the video both in this presentation and in the chat room. Um, this is just a, a listing of the Lisa Fitco interns that have been sponsored by the uh, intern internship fund at Crossroads Fund over the past several years. Um, this is a little bit of information about those, for those of you, uh, we all knew Freeney Nass. Um, she was a great Hyde Parker. She was a dear friend to some of us and uh, just an amazing human being. Uh, she knew Lisa in Hyde Park, and I so wanted to show the clip of her showing us uh, Lisa's apartment in Eastview Park, but it just isn't going to work on Zoom. Um, Free was one of the founders of the, the Lisa Fitco internship at Crossroads Fund, and she narrated the life of Lisa Fitco. Um, Free to those of you who knew her, led a long and active life in Hyde Park. She worked at WFMT with Studs Terkel and uh, was the, I guess, mother of the Chicago Children's Choir. We will miss her. All right, Escape Through the Pyrenees, I've uh, included in the book uh, this review from Publishers Weekly, which is, um, I think, about the age of the book. So the I have some quibbles with this review, but at least it is a review of the book. And here are some covers of the book showing Lisa that a uh, cigarette photo is apparently iconic. And then here's the final slide about the Hyde Park Book Club. And now we're going to move into a discussion of the book. So now, um, now is the time for you guys to speak up. It'll be interesting to hear from you. Um, I read the book and I was blown away. Um, you can all unmute yourselves now. This is open discussion. Um, I would be interested in, and we would all be interested in hearing what you have to say about your experiences reading this book. So,
just a reminder, you have to unmute yourself because I did mute everybody coming in. So. I can start. Um, I knew Lisa in 1969 and 1970 when I worked, she was my boss at the University of Chicago Art History Department. We worked in the office together and she regaled me with her stories of her life and world, her resistance activities in World War II. But I had no idea how much courage it took to do what she did. You know, she presented these things as a lark. And so when I discovered the book by that time, I no longer was in touch with Lisa. I had moved to California. And when I discovered the book, I was just amazed by the risks she took and the heroism that she and Hans displayed in their work. So the book was just a wonderful introduction, a wonderful retelling of what I knew but didn't understand. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, to me, the book was an amazing story, as you say, of heroism and, and yet she, it, in many respects downplays that part of the story. It was, it was something that she did, and this is something that Brini said towards the end of the video, which I encourage you all to watch that video. It's about 25 minutes long. It's not that long. Um, and, it, it, and, and Brini says at the end, she said, Lisa was very modest about what she did. She said, it was just the right thing to do. And so I think that was. Uh, Michael, I, I tried to yeah. watch the video a couple of days ago. And after seven uh -huh. minutes, it cut off with a message that, that it wasn't operative and to try again. So I don't know what experience other people have had with it. Well, it's, it's, it, there are two ways to access it, either through the Crossroads Foundation or through just straight link through YouTube, which is what I have got on the, the chat here. So I suggest you try again. I don't know. It, it's just a YouTube video. So I'm not sure what the problem would be. I was impressed with the fact that I really think her earlier work as part of the resistance was part of what gave her a kind of outlook that was collaborative and organizing and that helped her in what was surely courageous work. I mean, she did some of the things alone, but when she was in the camp, it was really striking how the, the women in Gurs who had been part of the resistance banded together and worked together and even found other groups in the camp who were more deprived than they collected food and threw it over the fence, you know, when the guard wasn't watching. So I think she had a wonderful, not everyone would use the foundation that way, but I think that foundation in resistance and collaboration was a real motivating thing for her and a real resource. Michael? Yes, Ken? I just have a question. How many languages did Lisa speak? Uh, we know at least uh, she was fluent in four. I don't know how many others, but she spoke French, German, uh, Spanish, and English. And Hungar fluently. I would think Hungarian also, or, or Yiddish? Probably, probably, I don't know that. Um, that's not clear in the book. I don't know, Jackie, do you know? I don't know that she knew Hungarian or how much she could understand of it. Um, and Yiddish, I'm not sure either. 
She may have remembered some Dutch from when she was sent to Holland, but that's not in, it's only tangentially mentioned in this book during the First World War when the kids were starving and family sent them to different countries. In the first book, she talks about you know, speaking Dutch like a native when she and Hans went back after, after fleeing Switzerland. Mm -hmm. They went to Holland for a year and she spoke Dutch like a native because of her okay. yeah. experience as a child. Uh, I used to be impressed at, in, in the art history department, you know, when a German professor walked into the office, she talked with him in German. When a French professor walked into the office, she talked with him in French. <laughs> she, she was amazing. <laughs> and that's what, that's what um, in her later years when she was working um, even before she went to the University of Chicago, she worked for import-export firms where she, her language skills were very, very valuable. Um, and it's interesting that um, she would become such close friends with Freeney Nass because Freeney was also a multilingual individual. She spoke, I think, German, French, Spanish, Italian, um, English, obviously, and maybe a couple of other languages. So the two, I, I, I just wonder um, when Freeney in the, in the video says, well, we were both late night people and we would stay up and talk about politics and we would stay up and, and drink lots of cups of tea and eat lots of pastries. And I wonder what language they spoke because neither one of them was English as a first language. Um, and they both obviously were multilingual. Maybe they switched back and forth. I don't know, Jackie, do you know that? I think they, if they switched back and forth, it would have been to German. Uh, but yeah, I, that's I, mean, I don't know, Jackie Zevin, if you know. I thought the book was very interesting because World War II is such a massive thing that involved so many countries and so many things. It was a little piece of the war that I, I had no information about at all. So I thought the book was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought one uh, ironic point was that uh, uh, Lisa was a Jew who was fleeing from Berlin to France and then she was put into a concentration camp because Germans were obviously suspected during World War II they might be Nazis and so here she was going to somewhere with it where she was uh, uh, looking for refuge and put into a concentration camp. Well, that, 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 that camp was run by by, by German people in France. The Vichy government. Oh, it was. I see. Yeah. I did. Uh, 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 yeah. can, I'm, a, can I'm, I I'm a World War II can person. I, I know the history of that. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. But I, I, I think that I, the book it gave the impression Gers, that they were French. Gers was yeah, French. Gers initially was run by the French. It after Lisa escaped from Gers, I think it was taken over by the German Germans, but. Um, I th she made it very clear in the book that there were French people running that camp. Yeah. While she was the Vichy government that was running it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was French. Uh, Vichy well, but, but that changeover happened before the invasion of the Germans. Yeah. So it wasn't the Vichy government at that point. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, she, she happened to be there just as the Vichy government was taking over. And that's when she escaped. But initially the government, that, that camp was run by the French, according to her in the book. No. The Vichy government were French, they were French. It, it was not the Vichy government yet. No, I know, but I'm saying that the Vichy government was made up of French. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, Vrenny is still very relevant after the 2016 election, I woke up 
and I was like hiding under the covers. You know, I, I, I didn't want to get out of bed. And I said to myself, you know, you, you, you can't hide under the covers, you know, if Lisa could fight against Hitler, which was so much worse, you know, you, you have to get up and do something. That's, as she would say, the right thing to do. So she was really a, a role model for me of always fighting and being active. So Ellie, did you know Lisa? No, I didn't at all. I'm sorry, I didn't. I uh, wish I had. I've just started reading the book. I haven't gotten all the way through it, but it's, it sounds like a fascinating story. And especially going through the Pyrenees and, um, you know, it must have been a very risky thing finding their way. Well, they had- Well, I would have- Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jackie. They had been pointed to a route that was a smuggler's route. And that was also at one point a route for the Republicans from Spain coming into France. So they learned that route and took people over on that route. Mm -hmm. Right, and what I found... Place. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that I found very interesting that Lisa was sort of the advanced person and she was the one that made the first trip right. on mm -hmm. that route yeah. all by herself yeah. with a very, very difficult um, person, Walter Benjamin. Uh, she did it all by herself. And then later Hans joined her and she showed him the route. But she was the one that trailblazed that particular right. thing. And Hans said that a couple of times in the book, um, that don't worry about Lisa, she'll figure things out, she can do things. And yeah. she obviously did. Yeah. Uh, she is a remarkable woman. Yeah. Michael, can you talk some about- One of the things that are, oh. Go ahead, Barbara. Go ahead. Oh. One of the things that really impressed me about her was that she was able to work herself out of any situation. She could always think up, think of the right thing to say yes. on a, a moment's notice. She right. was just amazing in that way, I thought. Very, very resourceful and, yes. and able to turn on a dime practically to get the right thing, to do the right thing or what would get her through it. Anyway, Quite I was right. impressed. There were so many narrow escapes, so many instances where, where you know, she dodged a bullet. And one of the things that impressed me was how, was what a terrific writer she was. You know, she kept the tension going in that book. It's a real page turner. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'm sure she didn't remember all this dialogue, but she was able to recreate the dialogue that went along with it. it you know, I was I'm just very impressed by what a fabulous writer she was. And I think, you know, that's probably what she was meant to do all her life, was to be a writer. And I'm glad she got to do it in the end. I'm glad she got to do it. I'm glad she finally got to retire and, and devote herself to, to her real skills. You know, when she started writing, she started in English. And it was her editor who said to her, you know what, write it in the language you remember it. Mm -hmm. So then she switched to German, which made a lot of sense and it was translated, but she is a good writer. Yeah. Um, Marla, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it's my understanding that she did not intend to, to write it. And it was one of her, she had two nieces, one of whom still lives in Hyde, but maybe she's out of town. Um, I forget her name, but she's the, um, uh, maybe Judith remembers her name. Um, 
and the other one has passed a few years ago, but the other one was... Um, I think it's Evelyn. Yeah, Evelyn. Marlena Eckstein, who was the one who questioned her. Um, no, she had a, a different name, but the thing is that she, um, she pushed her to do it. She kept, she was much more of a um, sort of an aggressive activist in the, not in the actual work, but in talking. <laughs> And um, so she really talked her into doing it because, you know, as, as has been said, when um, somebody would say, well, that was amazing, Lisa, and she'd just say, well, it just had to be done or that was the right thing to do. And um, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of these two nieces, but um, the other one kept really pushing her to, to write it down and, and publish it. And so then that got her started anyway. So there's an interesting story about that. Catherine Stodolsky was her, was one of her nieces. She was a historian and, and taught history in Munich. And at, the t at, at some point she was at Stanford. I think her husband was a physicist and he was at Stanford and she was there and she invited Lisa to stay and, you know, to visit. And while she was there, she invited a German publisher to dinner with Lisa and the German publisher. I mean, they, they, she invited them together because she, by this time, Lisa had written a lot of this, but she wasn't planning to, I mean, she didn't have any way of publishing it. And Catherine wanted to consult with the German publisher and find out how, you know, what Lisa should know about getting it published. And Lisa at this time had written the story of Walter, of leading Walter Benjamin across the Pyrenees. And, and it had been published, um, it had been published in a literary magazine. So this publisher sat with them and, and he was advising her, you know, what to do, how to avoid being exploited by a publisher, you know, make sure you retain your rights, you know, things like that. And then at the end of dinner, he was leaving and he said, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. And she said, oh, I'm Lisa Fitko. And he said, Lisa Fitko, did you write an article about meeting Walter Benjamin out of France? And she said, yes. And he said, forget everything I told you. I want to publish your book. <laughs> uh, Lisa, I have, a, I have a question. Did, was she a... a regular member of the resistance and did she have small arms training or was she mostly just a smuggler? She was not a smuggler. She, she was active in the anti-fascist movement in Berlin of the whole time she was there from the time she was 15, let's say, till, till the time she left Berlin. And she, and, and she worked with others who, who published, they, they wrote and published literature to distribute to German people to encourage them to rise up against Hitler. They were convinced that they could overturn the Nazi government and it was just a matter of time. And so, and so when she was in Berlin, she was doing that. When she had to escape because her name became known, she and went to Prague and met Hans. She and Hans continued doing this. They would take they would write the literature, bring it to the border, and they got uh, German ski instructors who were allowed to go back and forth across the border because it was part of their job. They got them to smuggle it into Germany and distribute it. Wow. And then when they when they had to leave when they had to leave Prague and they went to Basel, they continued the same work again. They called it border work. They continued their border work, and then when they had to leave Basel and they went to Amsterdam, or they went to Holland. You know, Hans continued to be at the border most of the time. He was, you know, he was experienced in setting up networks of of anti-fascist uh, people, and and so they would write the literature, and you know, Lisa would write it and type mm -hmm. it. And Hans would take it to the border and, and get someone to smuggle it across. I, and so the, it wasn't until they went to Paris, they had, you know, each of these times they had to leave, you know, they were on the verge of being arrested. So they went to Paris and at that point it was no longer possible to do border work. And so 
they were there when, you know, when, when France declared war on Germany and, and when Germany started invading, invading France and, and they were, they were incarcerated as enemy aliens. No, but what I was specifically was asking regarding her work in the Pyrenees, was she living in Vichy, France, or she only crossed the Pyrenees once? She was living in Vichy, France. Uh, the Germans weren't occupying southern France yet. Yeah. And so she and Hans were working independently, but they were working with the Emergency Rescue Committee in Marseille. And, and the Emergency Rescue Committee would send them refugees and they would lead them across the border. And they right. were living in a little town called Bagnoules sur mer and they would cross the Pyrenees and when they wouldn't take people very far into Spain because they couldn't be caught there. And the other people, when they came down in Spain, it would be Port Bou, B-O-U, which was the name of the, the town there. And there's now a monument in Port Bou to Walter Benjamin that was designed by Donny Caravan, who's an Israeli uh, architect and there was a multinational group who built this monument because when Walter Benjamin went across, uh, the Spanish changed their rules, I guess not sort of frequently. And he was told that he had to go back and he knew he didn't have the strength to do that. So he killed himself. Lisa said he always carried enough morphine and then the Spaniards were very remorseful because they changed their rules again. But he is buried there and there's a monument to him there, which has a statement on it, which is very much like things Lisa said, which was, it's not one person who does it, it's a whole movement. They really felt they were part of a group who were activists and who were necessary and everybody should be honored. And, and Ken, just um, uh, one more comment. Uh, Lisa and Hans did not go over the Pyrenees once. Oh, they yeah. probably went over a hundred times. That, that was my, they that was took, what I was curious okay, about. Yeah. So they led many they people took, across the border. They took, they took probably hundreds of people across the border in groups of two, three, or four at a time, twice a week for the better part of a year. So they took a lot of people over the border. Uh, Lisa led the first uh, with, with Benjamin, and that was the first time she had gone that route. And she had only a map to guide her. She was by herself. Hans was still not available. Um, and she made it over by herself and then Hans joined her and she showed him the route and they started making it regularly. As I said, two or three times a week with two or three people each time um, to the point in the book where it got to be so routine from the, for them that it was just part of their ordinary life, did, but of course it was they, extremely dangerous. Did they also help downed Allied fight, fighter pilots and bomber crews? Yeah, they did. They, yeah, those they, were, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I was just going to say those were some of the people that that, that the, um, uh, what, what's the name of the, the group, Jackie, the, um, the very um, high group emergency rescue? Assignment, uh, yeah, the emergency rescue right. committee. Exactly. Towards the end of their stay there, they started getting fighter pilots who were even harder to take over because they, so they didn't fit, they didn't fit the physical profile of of the, the right. Europeans in the neighborhood. They were tall and blonde and um, stood out like a sore thumb. So. Uh, but yes, they, they, they took whoever they were sent and did their best to get them out. Uh, and some of these people were very difficult. One of the stories I remember so much was, and Jackie, maybe you can remind me who it was, the guy who was determined to bring his fur coat I don't over know. with them <laughs> after, after they told, they told the refugees, you cannot 
bring anything with you. We, we have to avoid the border patrol. We have to avoid customs. We have to avoid all these people. And this guy insisted on bringing a fur coat with him and alerted the customs people. Um, they had all these kinds of, uh, one woman wanted to sit down in the middle of the square and start painting. I mean, as, as Lisa said in the book, these people were not living in reality at some point, you know, and we were trying to help them all the best we could. So it was that, an interesting. Uh, Benjamin, was Benjamin was a big pill because he always, he had a big heavy suitcase with a manuscript. Yes. And he insisted on carrying it and he wasn't, he was not physically fit and he kept sitting down and complaining and saying, I can't go anymore. And, you know, she would kind of physically sometimes, I guess, kind of push him to, to get him back on. So we get to the end and he commits suicide as well as, I forget what happened to the manuscript, but the manuscript has never been found. Right. But he was carrying it all the time. You know, there's, there's at least two or three separate war movies where they have uh, either allied pilots or soldiers or whatever, uh, or people escaping like from a concentration camp at the French Spanish border and being led across. Cause I've seen those war movies. So including in the great escape. There, one the there, um, there's, a, hi, there's actually a book, except there are many, many, many books. These stories were hidden for many, many years and they're becoming to light now. In fact, a lot of the Basque, smugglers who also led refugees across the mountains um, in many of those villages did not speak about it for decades. And, and these are just kind of percolating. But I did read another book that was just solely about the pilots. So there's, a, and I forgot the name and I have it on the other part of my house, but there is a book specifically about the British and American pilots who got shot down behind enemy lines and how, um, and it was a young girl and I think she's pretty well known, I forgot her name. Um, and, and I think they did a fictional book, The Nightingale or something about her. But in any case, um, oh, Didi De Jong, I think she was, she was 23 years old. And she is the guide who actually helped the pilots eventually get to Gibraltar so that they could get back to their uh, flight units. Um, but this story and Lisa and Brini, I have been sort of living with this for the last 15, 20 years. Um, you may know, some of you, that I'm a storyteller, and um, I grew up with a woman, her name was Nettie Fleischmann, and she was one of the German Jewish refugees who walked through the Pyrenees Mountains to Spain, and um, sadly, her route was during the winter, and um, the men were separated, they were supposed to, the women were supposed to have the easier route, and unfortunately it was winter time and snow. And when she got to Spain, her feet were frostbitten and they were amputated and they thought that she would die. Um, and I have always wanted to tell this story. And I met Lisa at the end of her life when she was recovering in Montgomery Place. And um, my mother-in-law was living there at the time. And when I heard that she was one of the guides who led refugees through the Pyrenees, I was so excited because I had lived my whole life next to this woman, Nettie, who was one of the people who walked through it. And I spoke with her about that. And she said that she didn't remember taking this woman across. And I asked permission. I'm putting together a, a program interweaving um, lives of people uh, through the Holocaust and may I tell your story? And she said, yes, but please read my books first. And so I did. And so um, I did. And then I was put in touch with Brenny and Brenny and I met several times, many times in fact. And I was so sad to learn that she died recently. I had not known that. And I have a photograph with her that I sent to you, Michael, right? Um, that you got. Right, um, right. Yeah. And, and she was giving me, uh, I've spent hours with Brenny and gave me a lot more information. And so I actually got a grant, I'm in New York now, and I got a grant from the Westchester Arts Council to do this program, it's called Feats of Courage, F-E-A-T-S, because there are three women whose lives I'm interweaving, including Lisa and this woman, Nettie, who were, uh, whose lives were saved by their feet. And so it's a play on Feats of Courage. But the thing about Lisa and the book and some of these moments that she talks about is her resilience, her amazing, and people have mentioned it tonight too, that she just never took no for an answer and under the most direst circumstances believed that she would survive. And, um, 
and yet she found humor. And I remember when she was in Boers and she would talk about with her girlfriends that they laughed. And, you know, even if, though the world was coming to an end, they always, she said it was very important to find humor. And the other scene that really is indelible in my mind is with her parents at the end of the book. And also when she and Hans are about to leave. And when um, they said that she had to have, I think a thousand dollars to be able to leave the country, um, she said, I'm only going with 500 because my parents need the money and other people need the money. And they basically said, well, what are you gonna do? And she got there and um, she managed to just give them the 500 and Hans, if you remember, was screaming and yelling and carrying on until they just pretty much shoved him out the door and put him on the boat <laughs> so that they should leave. But um, it, was, it was absolutely remarkable. And two years ago, I took a trip a road scholar trip through the Pyrenee Mountains, specifically to walk on the Freedom Trail and to do my research and actually be there. And one of the things that Bernie told me is that the trail that, and I don't know if it's the same thing that um, was just mentioned about the monument for Walter Benjamin, but on the pathway through the Pyrenees, there was a marker that honored Lisa and Hans. Yes. But then, because Walter Benjamin was more famous, Yes. They took their names off it, and it's Walter Benjamin's name who's at the head of the trail. But if you go a little further, I didn't get to see it, but that's what Brittany told me, that when you get a little bit further into it, um, their names are there oh, as well. Right. Um, and, and because of COVID, I have not been able to do this program, but I do intend to do it sometime before the end of the year and, and maybe even uh, bring it back to Hyde Park. But anyway, I know I went on and on, but I have been extremely passionate about her life and yeah. these connections that I have had personally with yeah. my um, former neighbor, this woman, Nettie. So yeah. that's my two cents. You that know, great. the I'm flyers, the British flyers, Franny writes, I'm not Franny, Lisa writes that she took them at like at 3.30 in the morning where there'd be nobody around. And because these guys are so tall, they're impossible to, you know, to hide. And they, she'd get them up to a certain height where Hans was waiting. And then Hans took over and then between the trees, <laughs> they weren't as visible. And so they found a way always to do something and to get past, you know, whatever obstacle. Um, and the time when she's with this representative who is Swedish and he represents the German government and he tells her he can't do anything, but she senses that, you know, this man could help her. And they sit there in silence <laughs> in the office. And finally he says, well, uh, if she's trying to get her parents out, is, is he a Jew? She says, yes. And what does he do? Well, he was a publisher, a literary publisher, a pacifist. And finally, he just signs, gives her some kind of paper. And when she tries to thank him, he gives this passionate speech because he is so, feels so bad that he's a part of the French army, which has capitulated to the Germans. He starts to then, he says, you are the ones who should be thanked. He stands up, is going to put his hand out to thank her and instead salutes her. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and this is where I think she takes the envelope from his desk. Um, oh yes. He goes right. to another room to make a copy. Right. He asks for an original of the letter and then he, she wants a copy of it. And she notices a, an official envelope and she just slips yes. it in her purse thinking that maybe she could use it another time and she did. The other thing that was so amazing is during this war, the mails worked. The mails work. They're sending postcards to each other. Yeah. Uh, if you remember during this whole time, I can meet you here and I'll meet you there. And it's just remarkable that the mail system worked during this period. Yeah. I have a quick question. Do you think that Lisa's Jewish background was part of the reason that she felt obligated to do the kinds of work she did that this was fundamentally part of her upbringing or her beliefs. Just a quick thought. Well, her father was certainly brave. Um, he published this journal, this pacifist journal, 
and 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 um, he, I remember he that she says in the book that that he tells her that there's a time to be daring, and and you know and also you know they they brought her up with integrity that they, they stressed integrity. So I think that it was definitely her family that instilled those principles in her. I think uh, Lisa was always very adamant about refusing to say, well, she rescued Jews. She really didn't want to limit what she did. I mean, she said she rescued refugees. She rescued people fleeing from Hitler. They didn't have to be Jewish. And I got the impression that her family life was fairly secular. Oh, yeah. So I would actually say that Lisa's answer to that question would be no. <laughs> but mm -hmm. other people who knew her better probably could speak to that more than I. Well, I would, I would just have to say, after reading the book, that the, the tone of the book, in terms of the people that were helped, was very secular and a very, um, I suppose, opportunistic in some ways. When it was better for Lisa to be a Jew, she was a Jew. When it was better for Hans to be a Christian, he was a Christian, or vice versa. I mean, um, this got to be a real issue because being a German and being a, a Christian or being a German and being a Jew or being German at all, uh, it got to be very complicated in that situation. And I think they were very practical people who were intent on saving other people. So they didn't make those distinctions. Jackie, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Did anybody see the exhibit at the Field Museum uh, in 1998? Yes. Which was called Assignment Rescue. Yes, I saw it. Yeah. And um, Lisa was on the panel there. Varian Fry was the That's subject right. of that. That's right. The story of Varian Fry. Yes. I read, I read that book a long time ago. But it's, it was a wonderful exhibit where you walked through a corridor. Yeah. I think they had, you know, they had notes tacked up like you would see when you were trying to find people. Right. So it was a good exhibit. And then they had a panel and Lisa was one of the speakers. Mm -hmm. Michael, one of the things, sorry. Oh, Michael, perhaps you can talk some about all the red tape that Lisa encountered in France. Right. I was just going to mention that uh, one of the things that um, we published a link to and is, is in the charts that I showed was a review of Lisa's book, which um, said that the book was very captivating, but spent way too much time on the the red tape and and trying to get papers in France. And what amazed me about the book uh, was not the amount of time that, that Lisa spent describing this, but the amount of time they had to spend in their lives making sure that they had some kind of papers, some kind of documentation, some kind of, and the rules changed every minute. The, the rules were constantly changing about what was valid documentation, what was valid, um, I don't know what they call them, um, travel travel visas, whatever. You, you had to have travel visas to get on the train. You had something that is so foreign to us. And a good part of the book is taken up with both her and Hans just standing in lines uh, spending time trying to get the documentation they needed to get where they needed to go. And all of this time, they were illegal. They were underground. They were not, they were, they were getting forged papers. They were getting papers. They were talking officials into giving them papers. 
Um, that saying? was a good deal of their persuasion and a good deal of their success in, in what they did to help other people. But it took a huge amount of their lives just spending time getting the, and, and we just, that's so foreign to us. That to me was an amazing description of a kind of life that none of us have ever known. Lisa, did, did uh, Lisa ever talk about uh, the types of documents? I know like one of them is an Ausweis, which was like permission to be on right property, which would have a lot, maybe that would have been good even in the French Vichy zone. Did she talk about that? Kind well, of stuff? I don't remember. Ken, obviously you haven't, Ken, obviously you haven't read the book. She no, talked I about I, everything. I, I, she I'll talked about every single, she talked about every single kind of documentation, the kind of documentation you need to stay in a hotel, the mm -hmm. kind of documentation you need to get on a train, the kind of documentation you need to get on a bus, the kind of documentation you need to go anywhere. And the rules changed on a day to day, a week to week, a month to month basis. So she talked about all of those. Huh? She talked about, and it was um, just, and that was why, and, and I found this kind of amazing about the book. When they got to the, Jackie, you know how to pronounce the, the city, that the, or the, the village they were in. At the, at the main yes. Well, does it better. When, but okay. when they got there, they didn't have to worry about documentation anymore. They were just helping people over the border. And the people in the village accepted them. So they didn't have to show documentation, they didn't have to show food stamps, they didn't have to do anything except help the, the immigrants over the border. So that was kind of like a place, to me, in the book, that was kind of like a vacation for them. Even though they were in danger all the time and helping people over the border, they didn't have to worry about all this documentation and being illegal. The mayor was a socialist and sympathetic to their political points of view. Uh, right. So they were in a sense protected, uh, but they did take some trips without documentation, which were very risky. You know, they didn't have a, a travel pass, but they, they went somewhere because they needed to. Exactly, and because they knew from their friends or from their own experience that certain trains at certain times, they didn't check your documentation. Yeah. But to spend your whole life worrying about that to me is just um, just so amazing that, that they did that and they accepted that as a normal part of life. I was just blown away by the whole story. To, to people who knew her, did she ever uh, look back with surprise or whatever that she had been able to do this at that time? Did she say, I, you know, did she have any, um, I mean, some, sometimes people do things as, as youth and then they get older and then they say, how did I ever do that? Or why did I ever do that? Is it, was there any of that in her or did she maintain this spirit of venture and dare throughout her life? I think more the latter, but I, I don't want to be the one person to say that, but I don't think she said she did that. She does say in the book at the very end, when she was, they were finally leaving, she talks about feeling empty. You know, it's like she'd given everything in all these struggles and getting her parents out and so on after, at the end. Um, but she doesn't, I never heard her say, oh my, how did I ever do that? I don't think she felt there was anything heroic about it. To her, it was like, well, you had to do it, so you did it. And that's part of, to me, what makes the book so amazing, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Right, and that's what Freedy said about her. That, that she just said it was the right thing to do at the time. And we did it. And she continued her activism in, in yes. Chicago. Yes. Yes. Well, perhaps that's a nice segue for me to jump in about my relationship with Lisa. I met Lisa Fitko when Bernice, it's build, uh, asked people to, to come to the Hyde Park Co-op meeting room when they were establishing the first congressional uh, saying freeze for nuclear weapons. And Lisa was there and Ben Solomon and a few other of the tried and true activists in the community. And at that time in my life, I mean, I had a lot of things going on and every time I got tired of listening to the stories, there was Lisa. She was just determined that it was so important. It was essential. You know, how could you not be supporting this cause? How could you not be working for peace and justice? The elimination of nuclear weapons, you know, and, and you know, every time I went to a meeting, Lisa inspired me to stick with it. There was no choice. She was determined that was the way she lived her life. That's right. And I was very, I feel very honored and blessed that I, I knew her over the years and she continued to inspire me because one of the curious things was that Lisa was born in 1909 and so was my mother. And my mother was born in Chicago, you know, <laughs> and went to Hyde Park High School. And here was Lisa and her life and the track that her life took versus my mother's life, you know, and, and um, you know, so I reveled in Lisa's stories. Yes. And then um, when the US Holocaust Museum opened in Washington, D.C., and we happened to be on a trip there and went to visit, they had not only their permanent exhibits, but they also had temporary exhibits. And so we walk in the building, and the first temporary exhibit is the Fitco Trail. And I say, what's this? And, and it was a whole exhibit. Perhaps it was the same exhibit that traveled to the Field Museum, but I saw it in D.C., and here was this exhibit that was documenting the people that were tapped, you know, to be, if you can get these people out, these were the, you know, the intellectuals, the artists, the, the philosophers, the scientists, get them out. And, and the, the charge was given to Hans and Lisa Fitko to do that. And I remember asking Lisa about that. And she, she talked about, she told me this story about Walter Benjamin, you know, and how amazing it was that here she got him across, they did it, and then he committed suicide. I think that was really a very devastating yeah. story and that she recounts in her book. So I, um, you know, I felt very privileged to stay in touch with Lisa over the years until she died. And, and one of the things, Michael, I wanna tell you is that in my book, when I went back to it recently, I found all these invitations to birthday parties for Lisa that were going to be held in the summer in the Eastview Park public area, the grassy part. And I'll never forget when Barack Obama was her neighbor. That's right. And he came to one of the parties yes. and she said, there he is. He hasn't responded to my request about blah, 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 blah. And she was always badgering Barack, who was our local state representative. And she said, he hasn't answered me. And he was, he was very charming and he was very sweet to her and very patient. But it was, I'll never forget that exchange between Lisa and Barack Obama, her neighbor in Eastview Park. So that's one of the many things. And if the Hyde Park Historical Society archives would like to take those invitations stuck in my book and add it to the Lisa Fitko, you know, file, I'd be happy to give that to you. 
it's very sweet. Well, of course, we'd be delighted to have you. You know, she also thank you. bring out a Japanese man who had lived through the nuclear bombing, and I can't remember which city it was in. And he was so typical that, you know, often people who survived it, they were very private about it. They were almost ashamed. And she got him to tell his story. And I think she brought him to the, you know, the sculpture at one point to do that. So she helped him come out and talk about it, you know, and as part of understanding the horrors of nuclear war. Well, and, and one of the reasons that I have been devoted to showing up, and you're all welcome, on August 6th every year at the Henry Moore mm -hmm. is because of Lisa Fitko. She yeah. just didn't give up. She said, we, we, we aren't at the end of this story yet. There's more work to do. Yeah. And, and it was Bernice Bild and Sydney and Lisa and Ben Solomon and some of these others who were not my generation, but they inspired me to say, hey, you can't stop. You know, if you're tired of going to meetings, you know, you have to show up. So anyhow, this year, August 6th, there's going to be probably a quiet remembrance at the Hiroshima, you know, on, on August 6th when the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. But here's news for everybody. On August 7th, a group of students from the School of the Art Institute who received grants um, to work on non-proliferation issues have chosen to give a performance at 4.30 on August 7th, starting at 4.30, it's going to be repeated on August 7th about non-proliferation. I don't know what they're doing, but you're all welcome, you know, to show up and see what's happening at the Henry Moore, August 7th. So thank you for the opportunity to give them a plug <laughs> and show up everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, well, do we, I mean, this uh, to me has been just a marvelous um, celebration of the life of Lisa Fitko and, and what she wrote and what she went through. And uh, to me, the book was fascinating. It was, uh, it blew me away. I, I've heard so many nice stories and comments from um, people here in Hyde Park. Uh, this is what this book club is all about and uh, I'm just so glad we could all come together tonight to have this discussion. Uh, do we have any final comments, Jackie? I have one thing. I inherited a three ring notebook that Frenny kept which was really um, a scrapbook of, you know, all things about Lisa. Mm -hmm. oh, my. I haven't read it all, but I mean, some of the things I remember, but people who would like to look at it, uh, you know, you could contact me. Uh, I, I think we've covered a lot of it, but if you're interested, I do have this scrapbook. Uh, Jackie, could you put your email in um, yes. the chat or your cell number because I would love to do use gotcha. it for some research. Okay, I will. I will. Thank you. I should be back in Chicago in September. So I hope to see you. Yes. And I gave you mine. Uh, I just wrote directly to you, Jacqueline with my email. And oh, my did you? Email. I'm saying it to everybody, but yeah, thank you. That, that would be great. I mean, anybody oh. can have mine too, it doesn't matter. And thank you for, for doing this. It's, it's great to hear everybody else's personal yeah. um, anecdotes and life experiences with both of them. I'm so sad about greening. Yes. Right. right. Well, you know, we started the Hyde Park Book Club back in 2015. And, and it's a little hard for me to believe it was that long ago because we started the book club as something about 
Hyde Park authors, books about Hyde Park. Um, somehow everything we do has some kind of a Hyde Park connection. And actually it was at one of our very early meetings, I think it was in 2016, that one of our book club members, and this was the old days when we all met in person, um, made a comment that, you know, there was a, a person who lived in Hyde Park named Lisa Fitko, who had written a book called um, Escape Through the Pyrenees, and we might consider it for the book club. And over the years, since that suggestion, we actually looked at that, but the book was out of print and it was only available um, through used booksellers, uh, usually at 40, 50 or $60 a pop, which was not practical for a book club. Uh, so it actually wasn't until this past year that the book became available um, online through an independent publisher so that we could offer the book as a digital, you know, as an ebook or have people get their own copies. We were, I'm just so happy that we were able to bring this, this program um, to all of you after all these years, because we've been thinking about it all this time. And now to have Jackie Curley um, and all of you who knew Lisa come together and talk about her and discuss the book. I, that's what we try to do. And, and I'm just really very happy that we were able to do it tonight. So I wanna thank you all for attending. Um, any final comments? Uh, otherwise we can uh, I just wanna share that she, she signed my book to me in friendship and peace. And I think that's the message we should all take from, from this event. And, and that's how I remember Lisa. I also wanna thank Michael for helping us get back online so that we didn't miss this wonderful, wonderful discussion. So thank you very much. Well, you're, you're most welcome. And it's, it's a great pleasure to to, to see and hear all of you again is, uh, and we're, we're actually hoping maybe later this year to get the book club back in person in like live meetings in our little uh, historical society building. But it's also been great fun to see everybody on Zoom. So anyway, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. It's always a pleasure to see you and um, until next time. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Michael. Yes, thank you. It's been a very. I, I have one last little bit that has nothing to do with the book, but just about Lisa. When we rescued a puppy from the anti cruelty and I took her out to the park, there's Lisa sitting with her caretaker on the bench, and this little puppy is jumping up all over her. And I said, oh, Lisa, I'm so sorry. She said, oh, no, I like puppies. She said, I like cats, too. I said, really? She said, yes. She said, I have a cat. I said, really? I didn't know that. I said, what's your cat's name? She said, Molly April. I said, Molly April? She said, yes, I got Molly in April. And we had gotten our dog on May 1st. So here it is, like May 2nd or 3rd. And here's Lisa sitting on the park bench. So I said, oh, Lisa, you know what? I'm going to change our dog's name from Sally, which was the name she came with from anti-cruelty, to Sally May. <laughs> and so I always explained that name to everybody. They said, how did your dog get the name Sally May? They thought from a comic strip or something. I said, no, no. They said, it's from Lisa Fitko. And then I had to tell them who Lisa Fitko was. But certainly I didn't give her her full due when I explained how Sally May Siegel got her name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and good night. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.